So, and now um, I have the, the great pleasure to, um, to announce a great speaker um, who has recently named as technology pioneer by the World Economy Forum. He's investor and advisor and entrepreneur. Um, he founded over 300 companies and raised millions of dollars to make the world a little bit better um, through technology. So please help me welcome Yobi Benjamin um, from the US. Yobi, please. Yeah, that's good. You go like, yeah. Hi. Hello. Can everybody hear me? I think so. Okay. Oh, look. Oh, great. Cool. Um, so, Yobi, we had a chat yesterday um, about um, moonshots and um, why we should be working to solve problems to benefit at least one billion people. So. What are moonshots and what is the concept of moonshots? So moonshots was a word that was coined over at Google by, I believe it was Astro Teller. Uh, and what it means is a, a project or an endeavor that benefits uh, at least a billion people. It's also described as a 10 to the ninth power problem. So you want to solve problems, try to solve problems that benefit a billion people. It's also the easiest way to make a billion dollars because if you can solve a problem for a billion people, you might have the chance to make a billion dollars. <laughs> Very good, yeah, right. Um, so tell me, you're actually doing some research in blood dia diagnostic and um, especially for the Zika virus. Um, so tell us a little bit more about it. So what are you exactly doing? So I have several projects that I'm working right now, and one of them is on the Zika virus. So the Zika virus, for people who don't know, um, is a very, very dangerous virus. It affects men and women, uh, and uh, the men and the women who get it basically have, you know, body aches, flu symptoms, you know, aching bones. However, for the women, what happens is you have a very good chance of giving birth to a child with microcephaly, meaning shrunken brain. So the brain is very small. The child is basically born retarded, or they may have a syndrome called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which means uh, the child is born paralyzed. So it's a dangerous thing because while it does not affect the man or the woman, you're giving birth to a generation of children who are either um, paralyzed or unfortunately mentally retarded. Uh, and so it's a very dangerous virus. And the work we're doing is to do uh, blood diagnostics so we can inform women if they are exposed to the virus. And what we do is we basically take uh, one drop of blood and do a test on the virus for women. Um, and our target price is about five cents per test. And it could be distributed um, anywhere in the world. You don't need a centralized lab and can be administered by, you know, uh, hopefully by people who have a little bit of knowledge because you still have to draw one drop of blood. So um, we just talked this morning about it. Um, do we really want to know everything, or do we really want to know um, what we can, I mean, I mean if, if we can solve the problem? So, if, I mean, you can do with that little thing, you can do 30 tests, I've learned yesterday. So, um, do you tell all the people everything, what you find out with that little thing? That's an interesting question. I think uh, the biggest reason why Zika is dangerous is because it's what we call an existential threat. It threatens the existence of humanity. Because imagine this, I'll do very quick math for you. A billion people live in South America. Let's say a half a billion, 500 million are women. And let's say of the women, only 250 million are, of, are fertile and can give birth to a baby. And let's say only 10% of them, of 25 million, have the ability to, uh, are bitten by mosquitoes and may have the Zika virus. And let's say only 10% of 25 million, 2.5 million are actually infected with a virus. And then let's just say only 
250,000 actually give birth to a child with um, a shrunken brain or paralyzed. The problem is women will not want to get pregnant because I don't want a, uh, I don't want a retarded child or somebody who would, who's paralyzed. Men will leave their wives because they don't want to be responsible for it. The worst case scenario, working family of two, one has to get out of the workforce because they have to take care of the child. And all these children that are born become a problem for society in countries that are already very, very poor. So I think it's important for women to know if they have the virus or not. Part of it is a political problem. These 27 countries in South America and Latin America, they're all Catholic. And the problem is when you know you have a particular virus, uh, you have to make a decision if it's 100% positive, whether you carry the baby to term or not to term. So it becomes a political issue. So not women knowing what their condition is, I think is the right of all women in the world. And you know, I don't, I, it's really important to just tell them and let them make their decisions. Right. Um, so, I mean, if you, if, if you leave that topic and um, um, go to one of your um, another great projects, the satellite project you told me yesterday. Yeah. Um, the, the satellite company is called astrodigital.com and you are having 32 satellites um, who map the whole planet um, all four days so you know exactly what's going on on our Earth. So how does that work? I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, um, actually, let's try to put the Astro Digital as the first tab. So what, what I do is I work, I have a satellite company where we launch satellites. We're building a constellation of 32 satellites. We've already launched, uh, we've already launched two, uh, which we launched on the Soyuz uh, uh, Russian rockets. We're going to launch uh, uh, four more uh, on SpaceX on Falcon Heavy. Uh, our goal is to be able to go and image the planet Earth once every four hours, every square inch of the planet. Right now we can do it even with our two satellites. We're able to do things every four days or every five days imaging of the entire planet. Our goal is once we have all 32, we can actually image the planet every four hours. Which is, um, I mean, every four hours. I mean, we, we discussed yesterday a use case that you can tell us the status of agriculture, for example. So um, the wheat, the rice, everything. So tell us about it. What, what, so, what's happening? Um, as you know, there is the worldwide commodities market, commodities future market, um, wherein you trade wheat, rice, corn, cocoa. In the, in the United States, you trade pork bellies, uh, you trade all sorts of agricultural items. We can tell you at any given time the state of where all the wheat in the planet is, where all the corn in the planet is, what is the relative state? Is it a healthy crop? Is it a poor crop? Is it in drought conditions? Is it actually growing? So now we can actually predict global food supplies extremely accurately. And this will also have a profound effect on the commodities market because there's going to be less, I think there will be less uncertainty in the way we predict the prices of agricultural commodities. That's just one example. And then um, you, have a, you actually can connect with the bandwidth 5 to 20 billion devices, yeah. right? So that makes you so independent from anything else in the world, right? So yeah, one of the other things that we can do, which is very interesting, and this is not, by the way, the slide up there is another, is my artificial intelligence company, but <laughs> in, uh, in the, at Astro Digital, we have the ability, anybody here watch uh, Terminator? A few people, oh yeah, you remember Skynet? So what we basically build, we're ba building the good Skynet without killer robots. So, um, and what we have is the ability to connect any device. So we've heard about Internet of Things, you know, your watch, your car, you know, your drone, et cetera, et cetera. We can connect um, 
5 to 20 billion devices from anywhere to anywhere. In other words, your, your watch can be here in Hanover, and then you tell your car, which is in San Francisco, please meet me at the airport at this time, click. So when you arrive, the car arrives there and they're all connected. It doesn't matter where they're in, the Antarctic, you're in the, in, uh, the Sahara, doesn't matter. Uh, we have both high latency and low latency services. High latency services are, for example, electric meters. Reading electric meters, they only report once a day. But we also have low latency services. For example, I can go and fly 10,000 drones from Hanover to Berlin, non-stop, or from Hanover to Paris. It doesn't really matter because we fly them all independently as independent uh, devices and we can control all of them. So they go and fly synchronously at the same time and this is in almost real time. So how can that make our world better? Um, if, you think about, if you think about the internet today, we still do not connect, we barely connect, you know, maybe a billion and a half people. There's six billion people in the planet. There is no internet, for example, in a lot of places in Africa. Uh, during the Ebola crisis, for example, um, there was no internet in Sierra Leone. There was no internet in all the surrounding countries. And it became very hard to go and manage the disease. So what happened, the reason why we were able to manage the disease is Paul Allen, who's a very rich uh, American philanthropist, basically donated towers all throughout the infected areas. So we were able to monitor the disease, the Ebola disease, everywhere. And by being able to manage the disease and know where the disease is, we were able to contain the, the virus. And when we were able to contain the virus, the virus burned itself down, meaning it killed all its hosts. And when it killed its host, uh, the virus stopped. So that's just a very quick example of what can you do when your, everything is connected. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can actually drop therm uh, thermometers, for example, in the entire Arctic, both the North Pole and the South Pole. And we can tell you real time, in real time, what global warming really is. Is it really happening? There's so many use cases of connecting any device to any device that it's almost like saying, what can we do with a computer? You know, it's like, it, it's, an, it's an X, X exponent. Basically, it's an infinity, one to the infinity in terms of the use cases that we can, we can come up with. Um, there, I mean, the possibilities are probably endless, what you can do with it. Um, but there's a... Another very interesting thing, I think, um, which we also talked yesterday about it, um, another project, I mean, you have so many projects, it's so amazing, um, to save the rainforest. One of the most important issues probably um, is, yeah, we take care of our environment. So um, you earn 2% of our rainforest. What yeah. are you doing with that? Yeah, we, uh, there's a company that I, ha I have with my partner, Mike Korczynski, called... Uh, Wildlife Works, we control, uh, own, or manage on behalf of governments uh, about 2% of the world's rainforest today. Our goal is to, to own or control or manage on behalf of the governments 100% of the world's rainforest. And the reason is, if we, don't, if we let all our rainforests die, all of you here, you, there won't be anyone in this room. In fact, there won't be a seabed because it is the source of all, our, of all of our oxygen. So the way we do it is a very non... We have technical ways of doing it. We have satellites, we have drones, we have ground sensors. Uh, but the most important thing we do is we take care of the people who live in the forest. By taking care of the people who live in the forest, we're able to go and help them take care of their home, which is the rainforest. I and mean, when they take care of their home, they, the animals don't die. I mean, take care of the people, to take care of the rainforest, to take care of the animals. It's a very simple business model. Uh, and by the way, it's, we are doing it for profit. We sell carbon credits. In all of these, in all of these rainforests that we own or manage, uh, we basically sell the carbon credits under the, under the Kyoto Protocols and the forthcoming uh, Paris, Paris Agreement, Climate Change Agreement. 
So we're a for-profit company, but we take our, our profit and we bring it back to the community and then we keep a little profit for ourselves. Most of our business happens in Europe. Uh, Allianz, Adidas, for example, uh, Puma, uh, great German companies, by the way, that, uh, and Swiss, I think, um, that have been contributing heavily to, uh, to these projects to, say, to save the environment. Um, you told me you also do um, educate the people in the rainforest. How, how are you doing that? What's, what, 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 what's yeah. the sense behind it? When we say we take care of the people in, who live in the rainforest, we provide education. In Kenya, we've graduated almost 1,200 children to, the uni to high school or university. Uh, we actually have daycare because if the women work in our factories, our factories, they make t-shirts. Uh, what do they do with the children? So do we have to build a daycare system. Uh, the men, we hire a lot of the men as wildlife rangers. So it's a full circle and ecosystem of services for the people who live in the rainforest. And we also, I think the most important thing we do is we start women's clubs where the women in the villages are, and there's, we all have, in Kenya, for example, we have 250 women's clubs. We teach them agriculture, we teach them skills, we teach them basic commerce, and these things that are important to sustain an, you know, an, an ecosystem that allows them to live with dignity and allows them to go and makes them believe that by saving the rainforest, they also save themselves. So all of these things we discussed right now are all big ideas, um, big thoughts, and, and just um, change the world somehow. Um, how do you get to all these ideas and um, make them real? I mean, I think that's probably what everybody wants to do. And um, I don't know, I mean, probably all of us has big ideas, but how can we make them real? What's your uh, advice? I, I think the most important thing is to have people around you who believe in the ideas too. A lot of, you know, Google, uh, Google, SpaceX, uh, uh, the X Prize, Singularity University, these are organizations that all gather people together to work on big ideas. But I think even us, normal people, uh, have the ability to do this. And we do this by getting people around us who believe in the same ideas. You know, one of my companies, so just a little plug, you know, uh, a company that I have right now, we're working on uh, artificial intelligence, and that's actually a company. And I had to think of a way to make artificial intelligence, you know, relevant to everybody. So we built a company that can predict basically the stock markets. We basically took all of human knowledge. The company's name is accrue.com, A-C-C-U, uh, R-U-E, I think, <laughs> I can't even, accrue.com. And uh, what we do is we take all human knowledge and take uh, and then quantitative algorithms that we've developed so that we can predict basically the performance of stocks. And I'm supposed, not supposed to say this because my fellow scientists and my fellow uh, founders say, don't say it, but I will say it. I think Great. we can predict 100% of the time and almost any equity and how it performs. Another, comp another thing, and the last thing, sorry, uh, Please, guys, is, is pa time. payments, right? This is, cr I've never seen a country where nobody takes a credit card. I went over across my place, I tried to play with a credit card in Germany in a supermarket and they thought I was crazy. And the real problem is because credit card fees are too, ex are too high. So interestingly enough, in the European Union, they have the European Central Bank said, we want you to change the entire payment system, and you have until 2018. So payments is a big problem worldwide. So I decided we'd start a company called Token.io, uh, and, and Token.io, we're helping, we're helping the European Union and all the banks in the European Union basically change the entire payment system. And that, because they have a directive called PSD2, Payment Services Directive Number 2, which all European banks, all banks operating in the, US, in the EU have to implement by 2018. So we decided that's an interesting problem because if you can take payments and change it worldwide, you change the problem for not only a billion people, but for everybody, including the Germans, <laughs> who, who hopefully will take credit cards next time.
Yeah, I think it's really an incredible thing that you can pay all over the world with your credit card in any supermarket except in Germany. Um, <laughs> I apologize for that one. I'm no. sure we will fix it some at some stage. We'll fix it together, Paul. Yeah, great. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts about Bitcoins? It's a huge topic at present here in Germany, or actually in Europe. Um, so what are your thoughts about it? So my last job, my last real job, was I was the global chief technology officer of Citibank. Uh, and uh, so I have a very deep understanding of global payment systems. And I can tell you that while Bitcoin is very interesting, somebody told me when, you know, I was talking to somebody that we process like almost like $10 billion of Bitcoin right now. And I said, that's very interesting, $10 billion. Except when I was at Citigroup, uh, I processed three trillion to nine trillion a day. So we processed at Citibank only 1.25 quadrillion a year. So when somebody tells me, oh, we have like $10 billion of transactions, it's not interesting, number one. However, the underlying protocol of Bitcoin, which is, is, is very interesting. Um, and I think the protocol itself has a lot of use. So if you separate Bitcoin from the underlying protocol, I think there's very, it's very promising. Bitcoin, the problem with Bitcoin, the anonymity, it doesn't really work. Uh, today, I'm, it's sad, I'm pretty sad to tell you that I just got a text message that there was, there was a suspected car bombing in Berlin and today, uh, right now. And in, the, in an age of terrorism, moving money anonymously is, is something that we don't really want to do. There is no regulator I know when I was at Citibank that, accept, that would accept that anywhere in the world. And if you don't have regulatory support, how do you do it? Fair, fair reason, okay. Um, there's one thing um, that just came into my mind. I mean, you're doing so many projects. You, um, you have so many interesting things. How do you raise the money in order um, to make that all real. I mean, can you tell us something about us yeah. in just one minute? <laughs> yeah, in one minute. Well, I'll tell you, I had two projects that I raised. You know, it's always, the, for me, it's always the idea. So I had two projects. One is called the Avigant Glyph. It was a virtual retinal display, uh, like a virtual reality device. I basically went to um, uh, Kickstarter, and I raised a million and a half for it. Um, basically said, are you interested in my idea? And they said, fine, we'll give you a million and a half. And this was from random people. Uh, another project we had was the Scully helmet, which is a high-performance motorcycle helmet. We did that in Indiegogo. We raised 3.5 million uh, in that crowdfunding. Um, some of the other things that we do uh, are just, there's some very wealthy people who want to go and con contribute. Like in a Zika virus project we have, we have some very wealthy individuals that basically believed in the project and say, here you go. I think the most fundamental difference between the United States and, uh, and Europe in general is the appetite for risk. Here in Europe, the appetite for risk, for risk is quite low. Uh, in the United States, venture capital, you know, there's, you can, there are like thousands of venture capital firms in the United States, thousands. Uh, in Europe, I think you can count them in the, the big ones that matter, less than 50, you know. And they, don't want to, they want to make sure that when they invest, it's 100% sure. That doesn't even make sense. If you're going to do venture capital, why are you going to look for something that's 100, 100% sure? So I think, again, it's about your idea. Um, the, the markets right now for crowdfunding are very healthy. Uh, there's many companies that have succeeded. There's one company in Australia that did beekeeping, just to go a, a beekeeping hive, and they raised $10 million in Australia, from Australia, sorry. They put it out in, um, in, um, in, in, in the crowdfunding space, and they raised $10 million. So the power of your ideas is really probably the most important thing. So... Um if you, uh, 
So if it's the main takeoff for me for today is actually, if you have a big idea, you need to believe in yourself and you need to have the one, the first follower actually, in order to get the ball rolling, right? Is that what we um, can say here? Yeah, I mean, it's not all about money. It's about having a big idea and having people who share your idea and getting people together on your big idea. And the power of people is far more powerful than the power of money. At least that's what I believe. It, you can have all the money in the world, and trust me, I know companies that have raised hundreds of millions of dollars and failed. And I also know of companies that started from a few people and have become multi-billion dollar companies because of the power of the idea and the power of the people behind them. So I think our time is up. Um, thank you very much, Yubi, for your time. And um, I'm sure you will be around for some questions from the audience. And um, yeah, thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you.